Good afternoon, everyone. I am Doug Nydick. I am the chair of the UPMC Pinnacle Board of Directors, and it is great to see everyone here today. Uh, it is, uh, we live in interesting times. It has been an uncertain and a challenging time in healthcare since the start of the pandemic. Uh, uncertain times are times that you want to rely on certainty. And we're here today, and the governor and Dr. Levine are here today to help us celebrate the certainty of the healthcare professionals in this facility at UPMC Pinnacle and in the rest of our UPMC system. And we appreciate your coming out to do that. Uh, certainty comes in experience, certainty comes in compassion, certainty comes in dedication, and the people in purple who are behind you are the people who demonstrate all of those, and we are here to celebrate those healthcare heroes. Thank you guys, every one of you. So I appreciate your being here today, and I appreciate everyone in particular being here and demonstrating the right things to do, wearing these masks. Uh, the governor and I were just talking about the fact that these are not the most comfortable devices in the world, but they work, and they work well, and they protect the health of the community. So thank you for demonstrating the wearing of these things. Uh, our, our setting today is Community General Osteopathic Hospital behind me, uh, but we are here to thank not only our staff at Community General, but our staff at all of our UPMC Pinnacle uh, hospitals, our staff in UPMC's system itself, and our staff in Pennsylvania and across the nation. We live in a time of heroes right now, and those heroes are protecting the health of the community, and across the nation, we're here to thank them. We are particularly proud here at UPMC Pinnacle to be part of the UPMC system. Uh, we're part of a system that's got incredibly deep and broad resources, technical and scientific and clinical resources. Uh, the UPMC system is currently working through the, U through the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, uh, launching a clinical trial to fast track COVID-19 therapies. We've got a ton of work going on there. Uh, we're also working uh, with scientists at UPMC and the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Uh, we've announced fairly recently a vaccine, potential vaccine against the virus. Those are the kind of capabilities that exist within this system. And we are very, very proud to have that part of the capabilities here at UPMC Pinnacle. In addition to these developments, we're proud of UPMC's system, systemic ongoing commitment to providing comprehensive care and support to all of our patients. And that includes support that protects you when you enter any one of our facilities. One of our particular problems as a healthcare system at this point is that we've got quite a number of patients under our care in our, in our footprint that for the last month or two have been afraid to come into the hospital, have been afraid to visit their doctor's office for fear of the virus. Uh, quite a number of those individuals are people who've got serious health care health issues on their hands and they've not gone in to see their doctor, not gone into the hospital, not gone into any of our facilities uh, because of fear of catching the virus. One of the things that we have done extremely well as we've made sure that these facilities are all incredibly safe. You're safer in this hospital than sitting at home with a especially with a serious health issue on your hands. Uh, so one of the things that we wanted to make sure that you were aware of today is that getting in to see your doctor, getting in to see the hospital is really key at this point. Uh, we're in this together and I again want to thank the, uh, the governor and Secretary Levine for their frequent and continued messaging around masks around sanitizers and washing your hands, around social distancing. Those are all really, really simple things, and they're things that I know there's a lot of pushback about, but in our situation, simple things are things that are huge things. I believe in science deeply, and the science is clear that masks, that social distancing, and that keeping your hands clean and using the hand sanitizer are things that will protect the health of the community. And we live in a time in which the actions of each individual will affect the health of the community, and it's up to each of us to take the right action. With that said, I would like to introduce Governor Tom Wolf. Governor, thanks for being here.
So thank you very much, Doug. I appreciate that introduction. And uh, I have three things that I want to do today. And the first thing is to say thank you. And you already did that, uh, you and purple and green and white. And I saw a pale blue there, yeah, pale green back in the background. You, you have been on the front lines of this uh, pandemic. And thanks to you and, and the, the, the sacrifice that you have been willing to make, the risks that you have taken uh, to help us, uh, I, I think is, is something that, that really mere thanks is just not enough. But I, I, I wanted to say thank you on behalf of everybody in the administration, I think on behalf of all 13 million Pennsylvanians. You have made a big, big difference. So that's the first thing I want to do, say thank you to you and everybody here at Community Health. I mean, this is really a big, big deal. Uh, you have uh, treated patients. You have uh, uh, taken risks to do that. Uh, you've been on the front lines, and all of us really appreciate that. So thank you. Second thing I want to do is talk about where we are in Pennsylvania. Up until a couple of days ago, I was really proud of being able to say Pennsylvania is one of the few states that actually has had a, a downturn in, in the cases. But we've actually had a few, and, and for the most part, we're still doing a pretty good job. But in the last week, we've actually seen a, a slight uptick that has been centered in a few different places. Uh, Allegheny County uh, has been one area of concern. And as some of you might know, Allegheny County has uh, basically said we're going to close down uh, the service of alcohol in restaurants. Uh, in, in Allegheny County. I think other places uh, are looking at maybe doing the, the same, same kind of thing. Um, but uh, overall, we are not one of those states that is looking at a, a big spike, a spike that actually threatens to uh, overtake the, the health the capacity of the healthcare system. Pennsylvania has been really in good shape in that area, I think because we did many of the right things, thanks to Dr. Levine. Uh, and her team at the Department of Health, but also because we have such a great health care system. In fact, we have capacity here and, and around Pennsylvania. And, and UPMC has been one of the organizations that has been at the forefront of making sure that we have the capacity to, to deal with this problem. Just as an example, many of you probably remember that in the beginning of the pandemic, New York's Governor Cuomo was going on television to talk about how the need for uh, ventilators was in the tens of thousands. Well, actually, um, Pennsylvania uh, has about 5,300 ventilators out there right now. Only uh, less than 200 are being used for COVID patients uh, as of last week. I, I don't think that's gotten any, any. Now, part of that is because the standard of care has changed uh, and we're treating COVID patients uh, with a whole host of things we didn't have before. But I think it's a reflection of the fact that we do have capacity in our healthcare system. And it goes back to all of you that we need to, to practice all the things we need to do to stay safe and reduce risk. Uh, but in the end, we rely on you to, to help us when we, we fail. And so, uh, again, uh, it's important that, that our healthcare system has the capacity. And the final thing is just to repeat what Doug said. Uh, we need to, to all of us, um, this, is, this is one, this is a war that we're all in, uh, that we have specialists and heroes who can stand up and, and help us when we fall. Uh, but in the end, it comes down to each one of us, 13 million Pennsylvanians, each and every one of us making the right decisions as to what we need to do to reduce the risk that we're going to get this disease. The enemy is that virus. It's not a policy, it's not a Republican or a Democrat, sort of like I keep saying the analogy is stop signs. You know, all of what we, so much of what we do in life is to reduce risk. Don't touch a hot stove. You know, don't look at the sun. Uh, don't do a lot of things. And, and we, we do those things to try to reduce the, the risks that are part of everyday life. Well, here's a risk. We have that virus that is out there trying to get us. And that virus is very contagious, it's infectious, and even if we're okay with it, and we can survive it, we might carry it to somebody else who isn't going to be in the same situation we are. And we've got to remember that. So wearing masks is one of the things that we all can do. Again, it's not a Republican, Democratic, it's not a liberal, conservative thing. It's just something that we do just like we stop at a stop sign. It's not a Republican or a Democratic thing. It's just something we do 
to make sure that, that we're keeping ourselves safe and actually that we're keeping others who might be coming to that same intersection at the same time. It's not a matter of the enforcement. It's not a matter of what law you might be breaking or what fine. It's a matter of whether you want to do the right thing for yourself and for the people around you. And for the most part, we Pennsylvanians do the right thing. And I think in this case, we want to do the right thing. And so wearing a mask, washing your hands, practicing social distance. If you're sick, staying home from work, those things actually make a difference so that we don't have to rely on our heroes to, to bail us out uh, when we, we don't uh, live up to the, the things that we need to do to reduce these risks. So let's continue to reduce risks. Let's continue to do everything we can, all 13 million of us, to do what we can to protect our families, our loved ones, our neighbors, our fellow citizens, and ourselves uh, in, this, in this pandemic. Uh, and so uh, thanks again to the folks here for doing what you're doing on the front lines. And thanks to each and every Pennsylvanian for doing what we need to do uh, to make sure that, that we keep them as safe as we possibly can, these, these heroes. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn over to another hero, the Secretary of Health in the Department of Health in Pennsylvania, Rachel Levine, Dr. Levine, who has been a remarkable champion for Pennsylvania in helping Pennsylvania steer its way, navigate its way through these uncharted waters. So, Dr. Levine. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Governor, for that wonderful introduction, and I'd like to, to personally thank you for your steadfast support. And I'd like to thank you, all of the staff at UPMC Pinnacle Community Osteopathic Hospital. Your efforts under extraordinary circumstances have saved lives. We are forever grateful for all of your hard work and for your service. Pennsylvanians can also show how much they appreciate your hard work and the hard work of all of those healthcare professionals on the front lines by taking the simple step of wearing a mask in public. When you wear a mask, whether you're walking on a busy street, whether you're inside a grocery store or riding public transportation, that is a sign that to the whole community that we are in this together. One thing that this pandemic has certainly showed us is that we are all interconnected in Pennsylvania, in our nation, and globally. We've learned a great deal since the first case was confirmed in Pennsylvania back in March. It's hard to remember. We've learned that social distancing and wearing masks and other face coverings when we are together actually do work to slow the spread of the very contagious virus COVID-19. We have learned that our communities are filled with heroes including the ones who are here with us today. And we have also learned that this virus is not gone. Across the country, states are seeing significant increases in states like Arizona, Texas, and Florida. And as the governor said, we have started to see a small increase just over the last number of days here in Pennsylvania. But whether our increases are small and the number of people who are tested that are positive remain somewhat stable, we know firsthand how things can change so fast. It has been great to be in the green zone and to be able to resume some of the activities we like to do or just to be able to more easily go to stores and, and uh, grocery stores. But we still have to be careful. We have to stay vigilant. We have to stay alert. COVID-19 is still present in our communities. It still represents a danger to our communities and a danger to our health that we cannot take lightly. And not only to, as the governor said, to our personal health, but to the health of our loved ones. So if someone, as he said, that might get sick might be in a younger age group that is not as susceptible to serious side effects, well, but they might go visit their parents who are older and might be susceptible. They might visit their grandparents who are older and have other chronic medical problems, and they would be very susceptible to having a very severe reaction to COVID-19. So once again, here are my daily reminders. Please wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, or as we hopefully all know now, the time it takes to sing happy birthday twice. Use hand sanitizer if soap and water are not available. 
Cover coughs and sneezes with your elbow, not with your hands. Try not to touch surfaces, especially uh, and then touching your face. And clean surfaces frequently. And please wear a mask when you leave the house. The wind is challenging. And if you have questions about your health, please contact your health care providers. If you need mental health resources because you or someone you know is experiencing a mental health crisis, please contact the crisis text line by texting PA to 741741. Or please call the statewide support and referral helpline at 1-855-284-2494. If you or someone you care about needs help with a substance use disorder, please call the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs Get Help Now hotline at 1-800-662-HELP. And for the most reliable information related to Pennsylvania's response to COVID-19, please visit our website at health.pa.gov. And what is most important, as always, for Pennsylvanians to remember is please stay calm Stay alert and stay safe. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Christian uh, Casita, president of the UPMC Dauphin Region. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. As Dr. Levine said, my name is uh, Dr. Christian Caicedo. I am the president for uh, UPMC Pinnacle Dauphin Region. Um, I oversee operations at Harrisburg Hospital and here at Community Osteopathic. Um, I want to use this opportunity also to thank my colleagues that are standing in the back doing some great social distancing and just being representative of the, the true heroes and frontline workers that, that helped us. Um, Dr. Goldman is going to briefly, uh, in a brief moment, come up and just give us a, a, an update on COVID and you know the dozens of patients that we have seen in the state of the system, as well as some of the innovations that are coming out of our partners from uh, Western Pennsylvania. First, I'm pleased to join our previous speakers um, as I've said, in recognizing and sharing the appreciation of our employees, our physicians, which some are being represented here, our nurses and other exceptional uh, staff that have demonstrated a commitment to our patients. Each have been dedicated to delivering the highest level of care of all the patient, for, to all the patients during this pandemic and keeping themselves as well as alleviating some additional challenges and patients that could not have visitors. This has been an extreme kind of challenge and I can tell you that the folks in the back have been much more than frontline care givers. They've been friends, they've been family, they've been advocates, and um, they've become close to some of these individuals. UPMC uh, uh, Pinnacle um, has directed uh, the caregivers that I have mentioned in environmental services, dietary, um, as well as others who have offered additional kindness and attention and truly make it uh, a valuable experience when patients have seen in our, are being seen in our facilities. In keeping with um, our patients and staff and the community safe from COVID-19 pandemic, we're taking extreme steps to prevent the spread of COVID-19, including universal masking for all staff, visitors, um, as well as our patients. And we're keeping our community safe for your health. And we wanna ensure that our facilities are safe. So please continue to seek the services that you need and come and schedule the, the care that you have let go for some time. In fact, taking care of the health is essential, of your health is essential, and UPMC is scheduling more in-person appointments and procedures in our facilities every day, all in line with the recommendations and guidance by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the Pennsylvania Department of Health. We want to make sure that, our fa that your families know that it is safe to do so, and that uh, you need to ensure that you're getting the care that you need. In addition, we continue to expand other care services. I know Dr. Salim is here. We're providing, continue to provide the telehealth services and virtual appointments as well as telephone um, visits that can provide options that will make it very comfortable and convenient for you to access those care that uh, those facilities and care from home. 
Our dedicated team of healthcare professionals has introduced has introduced extensive system-wide measures to protect to protect our patients, staff, and communities. We encourage all members of the community to get the care that they need. Please do not delay an emergency. My background is in emergency medicine and that's the last thing I want to see. Delaying care can lead to other complications and that is not what we want to see in our community. In closing, I want to assure the, the community that UPMC Pinnacle continues to monitor the impact of COVID-19 in our communities. We remain vigilant and preparing for a surge of cases should that occur again. We're keeping a very close eye on that and it is my honor to uh, introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Goldman, who has been leading the way in helping us prepare and help mitigate this problem. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to recognize our employees and my colleagues for their stellar work during the pandemic in direct patient caregiving as well as in research. I'm also pleased to share that for the vast majority of people testing positive, we're seeing that their illness is less severe. In central Pennsylvania, the number of COVID-19 inpatients in our hospitals have remained steady over the past several weeks. We've also seen a drop in the number of COVID-19 patients on ventilators since April. I want to use my time with you to speak to some of the research occurring at UPMC, including the REMAP COVID-19 clinical trial and the trials around covalescent plasma. I also want to share what we've learned to help keep COVID-19 patients off ventilators and what the community can do to the, address this pandemic. I'll be happy to answer any questions at the conclusion. First, as Doug Neidig mentioned earlier, UPMC is leading the way with clinical trials, including the REMAP COVID-19 program, a revolutionary approach that, will be, that we will be bringing to the area. The trial addresses the central question of how to quickly decide between new therapies for COVID-19 patients. The goal is to find a better way than double-blinded trials to efficiently and affordably learn what every patient has to teach so that we can apply these lessons faster. The REMAP COVID-19 program is an adaptive clinical trial model that relies on a type of artificial intelligence known as reinforcement learning to identify the best evidence-based therapy for COVID-19, much faster than using traditional research approach. REMAP actually tests entire recipes of treatments and is already testing many different treatment combinations across the world. This trial has 1,600 different combinations including the antiviral treatment remdesivir that you've heard about, along with different combinations of steroids. If one of the treatments shows early signs of performing better than others, patients are automatically enrolled more often into that treatment process. Physicians can be assured that they always have access to the leading contender of treatment in the moment and poorly performing options are quickly discontinued. The leaders of the REMAP COVID-19 program anticipate being able to release results assuming enough case data is available to them sometime in the summer. Although we have no specifics on that time frame, we can share. One treatment option being evaluated by the REMAP COVID-19 program is convalescent plasma, which is being offered at UPMC as part of a national clinical trial. Starting in April, this new, new potential treatment for COVID-19 was administered to the first UPMC patient. The treatment, which involves an infusion of blood from a person who has recovered from COVID-19 to a critically ill patient is being offered at all UPMC hospitals as part of a national clinical trial. The goal of the program is to find out if blood containing antibodies for the disease can reduce the severity of illness in patients receiving plasma. The final COVID-19 treatment I want to address is UPMC has learned to keep patients off of ventilators unless it's completely necessary as we noticed greater difficulty for patients to successfully come off a ventilator once they're connected. UPMC has started using drugs like remdesivir and dexamethasone, as well as convalescent plasma to help patients remain off ventilators during the uncertain time when we don't have a vaccine. In conclusion, as a world-class academic center, UPMC provides outstanding patient care and conducts research to improve that medical care. 
This positions us to meet the current health care challenge head on. In addition, each individual in our communities also has a part to play. We all have a responsibility to protect the most vulnerable ill and compromise one loved ones, even as well as, as we all eagerly return, eagerly return to a more normal life. The evidence supporting the effectiveness of mask wearing grows every day. Studies point to their ability to slow the spread of the disease and actually reduce the number of deaths caused by COVID-19. So please, for your own health and the health of those around you, wear a mask in public. Now, I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. And I am inviting Dr. Uh, Governor Wolf back to the podium. Dr. Goldman, I have a question. Certainly. Um, you, you know, you talked about um, like less severe in people that are testing positive. Can you talk a little bit more about what people should make of that? I mean, does it suggest to you the possibility that the disease is becoming um, less harmful or less lethal, or is it perhaps related to things like we're catching people earlier with the expanded testing? What should people make of, of what you said, though, regarding so that? First of all, I hope that it means the disease is becoming less harmful. I also suspect there has to be a, um, that as we've expanded testing, we're touch, catching people earlier in the community before they get sick enough, before, be, before they get sick enough to end up in the hospital. I frankly hope it means the disease is rest, less virulent. I suspect it has, it may be less virulent, but also has something to do with more efficient testing and sometimes finding it in younger people who have less potential to become as sick. Thank you. Um, so statewide, I think that uh, that we're seeing less people in the hospital, first of all, but until the last couple of days, we had continued to see decreasing number of cases. Um, and I think that we are uh, expanding our testing significantly. So we're picking up people with very mild symptoms or, um, or virtually no symptoms because we're testing more. And so those patients, by definition, are not going to be as sick and end up in the hospital. Uh, we also have, um, through our testing in in nursing homes, we have far less uh, numbers of patients that are ill in nursing homes by testing all the staff and all the patients and then cohorting people and doing infection control. Of course, those seniors are our most vulnerable patients and we're having m much fewer patients and much fewer patients that have gotten very ill. So I think that there are a number of different reasons. Um, I, I would love to think that the, the, the virus is becoming less severe. I, I don't see any specific evidence of that. We'll all hope for that. But I think it has to do with, with uh, the decreases in the state and the expansion of testing, picking up less symptomatic individuals. Secretary? Yes. Speaking of the numbers, uh, so we're testing more, right? We are. So of course the numbers would go up, right? It, that would be mathematical, I would mm -hmm. think, of the number of infections. What metric are you specifically looking at to say, uh oh, this is a problem. We're we're we're, uh, we're spiking again, mm -hmm. as opposed to just a raw number of a positive case. Sure. So um, there are a couple of things that we look at to, to differentiate that. Um, uh, one is the percent positivity of the tests that we're doing. So if we are seeing, if we're testing more asymptomatic, more and more people, um, uh, most of whom don't have COVID-19, we're going to see that percent positivity of the number of tests go down. When we see that start to go up in a certain region or a certain county, uh, then actually we're just seeing more cases. And then, I mean, so the, the perfect example is in Allegheny County. So really it's only been in the last week, uh, uh, maybe even less than a week, that we've seen significant increases in Allegheny County. Our percent positivity started to nudge up. Uh, and then we had um, significant discussions with uh, Dr. Bogan, who's the health commissioner in Allegheny County, um, seeing what she was seeing on the ground. Uh, and talking to her. And what she was seeing was um, more more young people um, who uh, had not been practicing social distancing, not wearing masks, and out in uh, particularly bars, maybe restaurants, um, uh, some of whom had traveled to California, you know, uh, Arizona or California or Florida. Um, and she, she really strongly felt that was leading her, um, her increases. And then um, after a lot of discussions, she discussed it with the county commissioners, and they decided on their order in terms of no alcohol in restaurants and bars uh, to try to limit that spread. And we strongly supported that. Do you have a thought about 
turning somebody back to yellow should the should the thing spike? Uh, we have no plans to do that at this time. And what we wanted to do is in a different in addition to significant containment efforts, and that involves the testing, the, uh, the uh, isolation and quarantine, contact tracing. That we uh, the decision that they made was to do a very targeted mitigation, a very surgical targeted mitigation, not not uh, going all the way back to, to yellow, uh, but to do that, uh, uh, no alcohol in the restaurants and bars, since that, they thought that that was where the problem was. Dr. Levine. Yeah. Uh, do you, are you aware of any updates to Philadelphia's plan uh, to enter a delayed entry uh, into the state's green phase on Friday? And if so, are you concerned about the progress given the state's increased case count? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, we have uh, very daily phone calls uh, with Dr. Farley as well. Uh, my phone call is at four o'clock, so I have no information uh, at two o'clock, but I might at four. I mean, he he he, ha he will make that decision with their local authorities, with the mayor, etc. Um, in terms of Philadelphia, and I know he's tracking the cases as we are in Philadelphia really closely. But I don't know his mind today. Yes, for the, for the governor. Um. governor. You talked about other places looking at what Allegheny County did. Can you elaborate on that? And the other thing is not every county has its own health department. What, what would convince you that this targeted solution of, limit, of banning alcohol in, in, in person drinking in bars and restaurants would be necessary for the Commonwealth? Okay. I'm going to ask Dr. Levine to come back. But there are a couple questions here. First of all, I don't think there is any certainty. We're, we are in uncharted waters. We're trying to do the best we can to navigate our way through. Early on in this pandemic, back in March and April, we were simply trying to buy time. We were trying to make sure that we were not going to overwhelm the, the health care system. So there is no certainty. We're, we're, we're doing the best we can, aside from the fact that that masks seem to do a good job of reducing the spread of the disease, uh, social distancing works, uh, the staying home if you're sick, washing your hands, those things. Uh, there is really very little in the way of certainty. I think we've learned more from a medical point of view about what we can do uh, uh, to, to treat people with this disease. I think with more and more testing, I think in the early part of this pandemic, we could test hundreds every day. Uh, most recently, we're up to 19,000 tests a day in Pennsylvania, and that'll keep going up. So we, we know more, uh, to, to your point, I think we, we, we actually um, uh, are seeing more cases because we're testing more people. But as Dr. Levine said, we can, we can track that uh, uh, if the, the positivity rate doesn't really change, we're just testing more people. I think we, we, uh, we, we don't see that as a problem. What we see in, in areas like Allegheny County is a, a faster increase in the cases than we see an increase in the number of tests that we're, we're given. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll see a reduction in the, the virulence of this, this disease. I'm not sure we've seen that quite yet, uh, but we're, we're still uh, looking at what we can do to, to mitigate. Uh, and we're trying things like if we uh, take care of places that congregate, I think Allegheny County is trying this by saying, okay, we're just not going to serve alcohol in restaurants. That, that's a place that people come together, they're in close touch. That seems to be a problem. I think one of the things that Dr. Levine said so we, we, we know when we have a problem, we see this uptick in, in cases beyond what's happening with the in, increase in testing capacity. It doesn't tell us exactly what the problem is. We think it's the bars. And thinking in the southeast in Philadelphia, they're thinking maybe it's the same thing. So, so they're looking at, at things they have to do. I think at 4 o'clock, Dr. Levine will find out a little more specifically what, what they're thinking. But we're all sort of trying to do the same thing here, and that is reduce the possibility, the probability, the likelihood that that virus, that's the enemy, that that virus is going to do something to harm us or someone we love, someone who we know, someone we work with, someone who's a neighbor. That's what we're trying to do here and we're doing the best we can. Are you considering expand, like statewide instituting that ban on bars in restaurants, uh, drinking no. in bars and restaurants? Are you considering a statewide? No. 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 Well, because I think, I think as Dr. Levine said, this, right now we're in the stage that, that I think we can do things with surgical precision that we couldn't three months ago. And so what we did three months ago was fine, maybe appropriate at that point because of the limited resources we had, the limited knowledge we had. We know more now. We have more resources now. We're not where we need to be, but we're in a, in a better position. 
And so we don't need to do the, the, the broad draconian things we did three months ago. And, and some of these more targeted, more surgical uh, solutions seem to be uh, much more appropriate. What works in Allegheny County is not necessarily going to work in Tioga County. And we at the state level will continue to do our job of trying to reinforce the message that this is something that each and every one of the 13 million Pennsylvanians has a role to play. But that in addition to that, there are certain guidelines that we can maybe reinforce. Uh, uh, and and that, that reinforcement from, uh, I think, a, a point of view of, of closing bars is more appropriate at the county level. Yeah, John. Obviously, you, you've been putting out messages suggesting that wearing masks is required. But clearly, some people aren't wearing masks when they're, where they're out shopping or whatever. Right. If, what, what can people do? What, what tools do people have? To enforce the law. Yeah, the, the 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 I think there's been um, much too great a focus on what's the enforcement mechanism and not enough on what's in my self-interest. You know, we do have a law that says you have to wear a seatbelt. Does everybody wear a seatbelt? No, not everybody does. But more and more people wear seatbelts now than did when I was a long time ago, younger. Uh, and that's because more and more people have recognized and internalized the fact that this is something that's in their self-interest. And I think that's what we need to do with this virus. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, wearing a mask really is inconvenient. Uh, it's not the same as not wearing a mask. On the other hand, not wearing a mask puts people around you at risk. You go to the store and you're not wearing a mask, you put the workers in that store at risk. You put the people who are shopping there uh, and who are near you at risk. Uh, and so I think uh, those are the kinds of things that, that uh, you're gonna do because Ultimately, you decide that's in your self-interest. Social distancing actually keeps you safer. Washing your hands keeps you safer. Wearing a mask keeps people around you safer. And those are the things that I think. In the recent days, from the state level to make to make enforcement. Uh, I think, uh, you, mean, you mean what's happening in Allegheny County? Well, I mean, your, your, your office continues to put out messages saying it's required and saying that businesses that have been told what, you know, to, to kick people out. Yeah. And, and, and most businesses abide by it, but I don't think they're abiding by it because they're afraid of getting a fine or a citation. They're abiding by it because it's in the best interest of their employees and their customers. We need everybody in Pennsylvania to finally uh, come to that conclusion. Uh, so yeah, we, we, can, we can have the, the, the enforcement, and, and we do. Theoretically, uh, the, you have to wear a mask when you go into a store. Is there going to be a police officer, either the local or state police officer, at every store for every hour of every day? No. You're going to have to make that decision. I mean, stop signs, that's the law. There's a fine if you go through a stop sign. Actually, there's a fine if you don't come to a full stop. Does everybody stop at a stop sign? Yeah, most people do. Is there a police officer at that stop sign? Mostly not. They do it because it's their self-interest, and that's what I think we need to get to, to everybody in Pennsylvania. We are in a different place now. We have more resources. We still need more resources uh, to be able to fight this disease, and we'll keep working on that. But in the meantime, the biggest thing we can do is internalize this, is to, for every Pennsylvanian to recognize, hey, this is, in, this is what's going to ultimately defeat that enemy, that virus. It's not a law. It's not an edict. It's my own willingness to do the right thing. Yeah. Governor, would you consider any type of uh, quarantine for people coming from hot spots such as Florida, Arizona? Yeah, uh, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, I guess, have, have done that. Uh, but then when asked, each one of the governors of those states, when asked, how are you going to enforce that, wasn't really clear. New Jersey, I think, is a self-enforcement. I don't know what they're doing in Connecticut, and I think the New York is trying to do a combination of things that sort of, eh, I'm not sure. Again, it comes right back to what I was just saying. Uh, I think it probably is, is helpful. I think when Pennsylvanians, by the way, go to Florida, uh, it's easier for a Pennsylvanian to get into Florida. I think they're stopping people at the border than it is if you're coming from Arizona or California or Texas. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think uh, uh, there, there are some reasons why you'd want to do that. The, the question comes down to the enforcement. To me, the enforcement is, if I'm coming from Florida, uh, I probably ought to spend two weeks by myself. I probably shouldn't take the chance of infecting someone around me. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I think it's a, a fine idea to say, if you're coming from Florida, uh, uh, we, we really uh, want you to be careful in Pennsylvania. The enforcement is really up to you. Regarding wearing a mask in the store, I mean, it sounds like you're saying 
it is required by law to wear a mask when you enter, the, enter, enter a store. Do you happen to know? Do you happen to know what the penalty is if somebody would be prosecuted? No, no I don't. Rachel, do you know what the penalty is? Um, from a legal perspective, not not specifically, but I think that the idea is the police would probably um, uh, recommend that you go home. I mean, if the police happen to be there, that they'd recommend you go home and get, wear a mask. They'd probably give you a warning. Um, if if they happen to have a mask, it'd be great if they could an extra one. They could hand it to you. Um, and we would love at stores if they have uh, you know they have inexpensive cloth masks or or the other type of masks to uh, to be able to give it to customers who who don't wear a mask. Um, but we're not looking looking to put people into jail for not wearing a mask, it really needs to become socially unacceptable not to wear a mask in public. Uh, just like it's not acceptable to, uh, to smoke in stores like that and to, uh, it, we need to make it, it is really just socially unacceptable to do that because you are putting everyone else at risk and then, um, and then you're going to be putting your family at risk. So it is going to be changing social norms, as the governor said. Hey, let me, can I just, I'd like to just ask your opinion on Sure. That. Say, um, you know, say there is a supermarket, um, and say, you know, one in a hundred, let's just say a handful of people go in there, a certain small percentage of people go in there in the course of a day with, um, without wearing a mask. And you know, the same people might be working in there that whole day. What's your, can you, do you care to give your opinion on how much of a risk that creates for those people who are there all day long? Uh, I can't quantitate that risk. I don't think anybody that can quantitate that risk. But if that person has COVID-19 and they are asymptomatic, meaning they just happen to be somebody that doesn't have symptoms or pre-symptomatic, meaning they, don't, they develop symptoms several days later, um, it, it'll be depend upon how much social distancing they did. But if they were right next to him in line and they started to <laughs> kind of cough, then it'll be more at risk than if they were, um, you know, ten more than six feet away. So, you know, given the variety of circumstances, there's no way I can quantitate that. But why are we taking that chance? I mean, w there's no reason to take that chance. It, it is, um, it is a pain in the neck, as the governor said. But it's not that hard when we're in public uh, to put the mask on, and it needs to become socially unacceptable not to do that. Yes. Just to follow up on that, how much responsibility is on the business owner? Because we have gotten reports of some maybe verbal confrontations between people, mask wearers and non-mask wearers, and then maybe the business owner doesn't enforce it. Uh, mm -hmm. the well, that's a challenge. I think that the businesses should post it that no one can come inside without a mask. Uh, if they happen to have a, a few masks available, so if someone comes in, they could be handed the mask, that would be great too. Some businesses, uh, especially large chains, might be able to do that. Smaller stores might not be able to do that. Um, but we don't want physical confrontation. So we don't want the, someone in the store to physically confront somebody so it ends up into a, a, you know, a, a verbal or significant physical fight. We don't want that to happen. Governor, do you want to? Do you ever go into a store where it says no shoes, no shirt, no service? How do they enforce that? I mean, I think it's the same thing. Uh, uh, if, if you pull out a cigarette and light it up, uh, which in the early days of the smoke, indoor smoking bans, people would do. Uh, but it just turned out, you know, the, there was a risk of, of, of secondhand smoke actually infecting somebody in the long run. Uh, so people just stopped doing it. And I think Dr. Levine is right that we're trying to get a new normal and whether we like it or not infectious diseases are part of part of our lives now that that they weren't maybe just a few months ago and we're going to have to change the way we live to keep each other safe yeah just a little bit uh there is a select committee on coronavirus steve scalise the whip i'm talking about congress he's having a uh, a, a zoom call tomorrow with congressman scott perry he says that committee is you're one of five governors that they sent a letter to concerned about how the nursing homes were dealt with in this state. Yeah. 70%, uh, nearly 70% of the deaths are in nursing homes, you're aware. What, what have you learned now that we're a couple of months in? What, what, what were their mistakes made? What should we have done differently? And what's your answer to people that say this most vulnerable population wasn't protected enough? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things we didn't uh, have was the capacity to test. 
Uh, we also didn't know as much about the disease as we know now. So I think we have a plan that should be in place by, fully in place by July 24th. We actually started implementing it months ago. And that is to, to test every employee and every patient at least once a week, right? Um, once a month. It's at least once and then retesting on an individual basis. On an individual, okay. So, so, but, but the capacity to do that, we didn't have that when this disease started. Uh, and I think as a result of all those things, the, the uh, case count in nursing homes uh, among both patients and employees is, is down dramatically. So, yeah, uh, acknowledge that that, um, uh, that has been a, a hot spot. It's been something we've been focused on, worried about since the beginning. And I think we're in much, much better place now than we, than we were. We still have, and we announced this on Friday, I guess, the, the protocols for visits and visitation. Uh, which is a three-step process, depending on how those tests turn out. Um, and, you know, maybe there are more things that, that we could do, but that's what we're doing right now. We're taking this very seriously. There was a letter on March 18th telling nursing homes they had to keep their patients. Was the logic behind that you didn't want to swamp hospitals by emptying nursing homes into hospitals at that point where there was concern we were going to swamp the hospitals? Yeah, I think that was a decision by the hospitals. Yeah, that's the second sure. So thank you. First, I'd like to just address a little bit what you were talking about before. Um, th there was an article in the New York Times on Saturday which talked about the burden um, of COVID-19 in nursing homes throughout the country. Uh, and so this has been an issue where in any state that has had a high prevalence of COVID-19, including Pennsylvania. And so we are right there with many other states that have struggled in terms of controlling the spread of COVID-19 among very seriously um, ill, potentially seriously ill seniors in, in, a, in a small congregate setting. And so it's been extremely challenging. Um, there's recent evidence um, from um, a number of academics, uh, Dr. Moore at Brown and Dr. Werner at Penn, that really the incidence or the prevalence of, of COVID-19 in a nursing home is directly correlated to the prevalence of COVID-19 in the county where it's located. And so unfortunately, it was extremely brave um, uh, personnel like here that were working in nursing homes uh, where there was a lot of COVID-19 and unbeknownst to them, they were asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic and it entered the nursing homes because there were no other visitors. In terms of the policy that you're talking about, um, so there was a, a um, uh, the co guidance from, the, from CMS in, in March that if someone was in a nursing home and got sick with COVID-19 and they became very ill, that they would be transferred to the hospital. When that patient was better, they would go home, which would be to their facility. And then we would work with them in order to, uh, in terms of infection control and cohorting, et cetera. And so like every other state, uh, we followed CMS guidance in terms of, of doing that and then worked with the nursing homes to make sure they had PPE, to make sure that they had um, the, the, the right ability to cohort um, and uh, infection control procedures to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So to be honest with you, all the states are, are together in, in the challenges of this, and it's going to remain a challenge because you have seniors who are more prone to serious complications uh, in congregate settings, and it's going to remain a challenge. As the governor said, um, you know, we are now testing every patient, we're testing every staff member in every facility. Uh, and uh, then the retesting will continue and that will be done on an individual basis. So if you have a nursing home in a county that has very few cases and they have no cases, then it doesn't make sense to necessarily do it in a week on a knee jerk. So we'll in individualize when they need to retest. And if you, you have a nursing home that's had a lot of cases and they're in a county that has had a very high prevalence, well, they're going to need to retest much more. So we're going to individualize that and work with the nursing homes on it. Just to follow up yeah. on that, in, in the letter, the House Republican leader said the uh, department's policy to mandate nursing homes admit untested and contagious COVID-19 patients from hospitals. They say that likely contributed to thousands of elderly, de elderly deaths in Pennsylvania. Do you think that is that an accurate statement that they're making? There is no there is no evidence that 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 policy itself contributed to 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 that many deaths. So you're correct. We had 68 to 70 percent of the deaths in Pennsylvania were in nursing homes, which is higher than many states and actually less high than other states. The the, the, the having. Um, seniors, many, many of whom, if not most of whom, have uh, chronic medical conditions, comorbid conditions in a congregate setting with a very contagious respiratory virus is going to be an extreme challenge.
about more. Yeah, one more question. Um, yeah. The House last week, they passed legislation limiting your emergency power, specifically when it comes to guns. They want you to not be able to restrict guns during a disaster emergency declaration. Press Secretary said you oppose it. Would you veto that legislation? Yeah, I, what, what we really need is is give me the ability that passed the Senate almost, unan I think, unanimously and, and was held up by the Speaker in the House uh, declaring a medical emergency. I mean, I, I don't want to do anything with guns. This is about a medical emergency. And, and what we need in Pennsylvania is the ability to target uh, 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 disaster declarations to the specific problem. Uh, right now, all we have in Pennsylvania is a broad disaster declaration, which, yeah, gives the governor all kinds of broad powers. I don't need that. I don't want that the power to, to, to do anything with guns. I want, I want the power to make decisions quickly that can actually attack and, and address the challenges we have with this disease. The easiest thing to do would be what we originally did and what the Senate, Republicans and Democrats did, and that is give the governor, Republican, Democrat, now and in the future, the ability to declare a emer medical emergency. Thank you very much, everybody. Phillies, Phillies. Okay.